Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. We're going to take up this conversation one step beyond the conversation that got started this morning and uh, talk about athletes as employees or as workers. Um, there are obviously many different contexts. There's college sports, there's um, Olympic sports and professional sports. Um, but we're going to, even though there's these different buckets, we're, that's what we're going to be talking on. First person to speak, first presentation is John Woolahan. Did I pronounce that right? Woolahan. Woolahan, okay. <laughs> John Woolahan. And he's a professor of sports law at Syracuse University, and he teaches both undergraduate and at the law school. So with that, take it away. And I hope you don't mind. I'm going to sit down too. Okay. Just instead of standing up. <laughs> So from the time I, I proposed coming here and, and talking, things have changed a little uh, in the area of, of uh, college sports in particular. So what I was going to do is mostly look at the antitrust challenges that the NCAA has been facing uh, and then kind of move on and look at the future of, of maybe what would happen if they lost those cases and um, colleges had to pay the student athletes themselves. Um, what I've added now is I wanted to add a little of the California Fair, uh, Fair Play to Pay Act, Pay for Play Act, um, and I wanted to look at some of the impacts uh, of other states trying to reenact or enact that uh, same rule. One of the things about California is once the governor uh, signed it, both South Carolina and New York uh, came out and said that they wanted to do something as well, and other states have followed. But both of those added a component that, South, or that California doesn't have. South Carolina wanted to pay $5,000 per student uh, in addition to the image rights. And New York, the state senator out of Brooklyn, wanted to give the students 15% of all the revenues that schools generated uh, via athletics. And at a school like Syracuse, we have 500 student athletes. Our athletic um, department generates close to, um, I think it's about, let's say, $80 million. Um, and so that's, I, we calculated, I could have get the numbers wrong, but we calculated about $15,000 extra per student athlete. Once again, it doesn't depend, doesn't matter which um, sport the athlete is paying, um, that money was going to go directly to the students. Once again, that was a proposal that the state senator out of Brooklyn um, uh, mentioned. It hasn't been introduced in the New York State uh, Legislature, so it's just, just kind of floating out there. But one of the things that's interesting is you can see that all of these states after California are racing to kind of add more components onto their laws, and it's one of the things that the NCA really does need to get in front of, because if they kind of wait to school, or for the states to, to, to start regulating this, um, I'm not sure that the NCA or the colleges are going to like how, how it ends up, especially if all of a sudden we're, we're looking at a place like uh, New York where you've got a 15% surtax on um, the athletic department. Um, so anyways, I want to start once again kind of looking at some of the challenges that the NCA has faced in the last few years. And they begin kind of with image rights, kind of appropriately. The image rights challenge is that these students <coughs> use brought against the NCA. Um, in particular, the two main, main, main plaintiffs in a number of lawsuits that are coming, one was Sam Keller and the other one was Ed O'Bannon. Uh, both of them found their images on a EA Sports video game uh, that the NCA marketed with collegiate athletics or licensing and EA Sports. Um, the players believe that this was an unfair use of their image rights and they challenged it under, under um, right of publicity. The California courts finding that the EA Sports had not transformed the product enough, that they hadn't changed it enough, and that the image was actually taken, found in favor of the players. And both, um, before it was appealed to the Ninth Circuit, 
both EA Sports and Collegiate Licensing settled for $20 million each. Uh, the NCAA would eventually settle as well so that the student athletes um, were able to recover $60 million uh, from those lawsuits. It's the first example of um, student athletes actually getting paid because that money was actually paid out to the students um, who appeared in the games. The next major um, kind of lawsuit that the NCAA faced or college sports faced was the Northwestern case. And I know we're going to um, hear about that soon. Uh, but once again, the Northwestern case was a group of football players at Northwestern University who wanted to unionize. Um, and they brought it to the regional board in Chicago. And the regional director found that these football players, scholarship football players, were employees of the university and therefore could unionize. Um, and I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to steal anyone else's thunder by talking too much about that. Um, and then it leads to the next kind of lawsuits. The O'Bannon case, the, the image rights case, morphed into much more. It morphed into a um, antitrust challenge that once again went through the district court, the federal district courts in California, and once again up to the Ninth Circuit Court. Um, in an interesting case, um, the district court judge, Judge Wilkins, found for the first time, or, not, or maybe not the first time, but with its relationship to players, it found that the scholarship that the, um, the NCA imposed was an illegal restraint of trade. Okay, so by imposing a scholarship, it wasn't an illegal restraint. And we'll just call it price fixing for, for simplicity. They put a price cap on what they could pay the student athletes. Student athletes could only get cost of attendance, plus they couldn't get cost of attendance at that time, but they could only get a scholarship. Um, it didn't matter which school wanted them, it didn't matter which school they wanted to go to, all they could get was the price of their scholarship. Um, and so for the first time, there's that challenge, and we've got this NCA, we've got this ruling against the NCA that their policies were an illegal restraint. Um, the Jenkins case kind of tries to, tries to build on that momentum and find that the whole system of college sports um, is illegal, not just um, not just the cost of attendance getting students a cost of attendance, but it, actually the market itself. They wanted to open up the market so that student athletes could be bid on. Right? So here at Syracuse University, we want a seven foot basketball player, we're going to give him a million dollars. Okay? Maybe he's only worth 500000 to Duke. In that type of an open market, Jenkins is claiming any type of restraint is going to be illegal. In both the O'Bannon and the uh, jenkins Austin case, the courts found that even though the NCA's restraints were an illegal uh, against, violated the antitrust law, they were reasonable as far as um, they still regulated college sports, they still regulated amateurism. Um, anything that they gave them above and beyond the educational value was going to be um, basically opening up the door and destroying the NCA. And therefore, um, it was reasonable to have restraints above and beyond cost of attendance. Uh, the Jenkins case added some educational benefits um, that, the that the schools could then pay. Um, so once again, they've added a little bit more, and we'll see kind of what that means. So what does, uh, one of the questions is, can I give now a student a $20,000 laptop um, every semester it's for his educational purpose? Um, if he lives off campus, can I give him a car? Is that for educational purposes? He's got to get to campus. So those types of things still are going to be debated. Um, once again, from there, that was kind of the, the majority of the talk I was hoping to. But since we moved into the fair play, um, we see kind of more and more the, this question of image rights coming into play. And the schools challenging, um, or the NCA fighting that any type of money that's given to the students is going to kind of destroy college sports. It's going to create this professionalism. Um, and so the NCA is in negotiation, or is in committee trying to figure out what to do with um, um, the names and image rights. And I do believe that they'll probably come up with some type of uh, system that's based off California's law. Um, once again, as someone mentioned this morning, it doesn't go into effect until 2023. Um, that being said, one of the states that I didn't mention, Florida, has proposed legislation 
that actually calls into effect um, a new le a state legislation that goes into effect in 2020. So the NCA is running out of time um, if they're trying to keep up with the states. So what is the future for college sports as far as paying student athletes? Um, I believe that the future is student athletes getting the rights to um, control their image rights. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to open up the doors for some very large salaries for certain players. Uh, Zion Williamson would have been a perfect example. He would have been able to cash in. Um, but I also believe it's going to cash, it's going to allow a lot of non-revenue athletes to cash in as well. Um, we saw the, the woman gymnast from UCLA last year. Um, if she was able to cash in on her personality and her um, likeness, she would have been able to make a few dollars. Um, and what the NCAA's rules are doing is they're restricting those athletes from, from making, a, I don't want to say making a living, but making some money. It's also preventing coaches or student athletes from working as coaches during the summer and during the school year. You can imagine a tennis coach um, working during the school year as a coach to, to profit off of their, um, the services that they provide. Um, so I do see that. I don't see the schools paying the student athletes. Um, and I think if you're the NCA, if you're the schools, the name and likeness is something that you should actually be getting behind. Because otherwise, the O'Bannon cases and the, the Jenkins cases are pushing for more and more that the Syracuse's of the univers universities of the world write those checks. And we're much happier when Nike writes that check as opposed to the school. So I'll leave it at that. Um, when, when, when states pass these laws, do you think that there's, since um, having a winning program is about recruiting, do you think that it's going to force schools to get some of their boosters or, or uh, you know, who owns a car dealership to offer um, the best athletes uh, endorsements? Yeah, I mean, and that's the fear. The mm -hmm. fear is that all of a sudden, um, once again, I'll pick on Syracuse. Um, one of our local car dealers is going to look at that seven-footer and say, hey, come back to Syracuse, come to Syracuse and we'll give you X number of dollars. Um, He's also a businessman, and he's going to, after a while, figure out that giving that seven-footer um, $50,000 just to use his image isn't really driving money, people into the store. Right. If it is, he'll keep doing it, but if it's not, I mean, he's going to stop pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I think the, the fear that the schools have is that somehow the money's going to be diverted from the school to the athlete. And it's really important to note that, once again, those athletes can't um, use the SU logos and trademarks. We own those. And so um, if they want to be um, use Syracuse or UCLA or USC, those jerseys in an ad, they're going to have to pay the schools money as well. So. OK. Yeah. OK, well, well, we'll talk more. OK, next I would like to. Um, um, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Wolf Root, who is a uh, doctoral candidate, and he's also a uh, student athlete activist. And um, he's at uh, University of Boulder at Colorado, University of Colorado at Boulder, right now, right up the street here. Um, so take it away. We'll get my slides up in a sec. Um, while those are going up, show of hands, who was at the morning session on college athletics today? So for those of you who weren't at the session, was anyone not at the morning session and is not familiar with how college sports operates in the USA? Okay, good. We can keep some of that background out of the way. Um, so my talk is Workers of the Court Unite, a case for college athlete unionization. Uh, for those who were at the morning talk or for those who follow any of this at all, most of the conversations around what little tweaks can we do to stay ahead of this growing onslaught of athletes fighting for their rights. Um, so as just mentioned, schools should want name, image, and likeness to pass because if they don't, we're going to get pushed further down the path. Everything from scholarships to laundry money to full cost of attendance, thinking, have come from fights to the courts for athletes. And I think what we're going to see is 
given the reality of college sports, at least the big time D1, there's only one ethical solution, and that is to view these athletes as workers and give them workers' rights as humans. Um, next slide, please. And I have a clicker. Um, okay, cool. So the basics, it's a little so just a little background for those who aren't aware, um, this is a business. Anyone who says big time college sports or college sports are just this fun thing we do, are don't know what they're talking about or are lying through their teeth. Um, there are five Power Five conferences, as discussed earlier. One is the Pac-12. Their own conference admits that during the season, athletes spend 50 hours per week on their sport, despite the fact that we have NCAA regulations on 20 countable hours per week. Um, and there's even a lot of wiggle room there takes a ton of time, and it's a huge business. So the NCAA brings in about a billion dollars a year. And when you realize that the NCAA is an oversight body that effectively runs championships, and that's about it, that's nothing. People say overall it's like a 15-ish billion dollar industry for big time college sports. Since we're in Colorado Springs, connected with the University of Colorado system, some quick border numbers up there, um, we brought in about $85 million in revenue, um, and there's, what did I say there? 38 schools bringing in over $100 million in revenue. It's an insane amount of money. Our new head football coach, which got hired just this last year, has a five-year $14.75 million deal, which is low for head coaches, and our eighth highest paid assistant coach gets over $200,000 a year. Just for fun, a, I have this fun stat that the Outback Bowl, one of these bowl football games that is played by amateur unpaid labor, gets a million dollars a year just for one game. And the athletes not only aren't paid, aren't allowed to be bought a coffee for their good touchdown or event for that like of the Ridiculous. So we have to recognize that their rights are not being respected. Obviously, we have the compensation issue. They do not have the right to bargain for compensation. Regardless of what the result would look like, they do not have a seat at the table that is unjust. Then we have lots of other issues, so long-term health care. Um, we're getting a little better with some long-term care for extreme events that happen, but more and more information is coming out, out about long-term brain damage from impact, and it's not just on the field. Anyone who follows CTE knows there's more evidence coming out. It's all the little hits that happen in practice. A lot of that is not given the respect it deserves. Um, then we have things like transfer rules, even though some of this has been released. If your school doesn't want to let you transfer to a new employer, well, the coach can do it, but unless you have extenuating circumstances, you can't. Um, and until recently, even if like family issues were allowed, well, we just don't treat athletes as people. We treat them as things to make money for the university. Okay. So as mentioned, unionization is the way to go. Um, so, as mentioned, I'm an organizer, I'm a graduate labor organizer, um, so I want to connect kind of the graduate student struggle to that, because there's some cool analogies, but first we should recognize, obviously, the professional players unions are the obvious analogy to the big time sports stuff. They have won the abilities for compensation, they're known all throughout the world, they're obviously the central people in these industries. No one would watch the NBA without NBA players, no one would watch a college football when it comes to graduate labor, we are fighting similar struggles in some important senses. College athletes are on campus for four or five years and that's it. That makes it really hard for a long time struggle or just to keep waiting for the NCAA because, you know, keep waiting. Uh, it's also the case, though, that the industry wouldn't exist without them. So obviously college sports wouldn't exist without the athletes. Um, Classes, first and second year classes, wouldn't exist without underpaid labor by graduate students. Um, anyone who's on a college campus that has graduate students knows this. Same with the research. Um, but let's look at uh, big time college sports for a minute and just see. So, free agency, just this very basic right of athletes, largely came about in MLB from very public struggle with Kurt Flood, who of course then was black and the Players Association. This basic right was won by their union. Uh, the NFL in 2011 won some really nice safety rules for practice. Um, interestingly, um, I talked with Chris Borland, a former uh, NCAA star and NFL star for a year who quit due to some injury concerns. He talked to my sports uh, philosophy class and talked about that he felt safer in the NFL with their practice rules than the NCAA, um, in part because of these better rules that were fought for 
by their labor union. Uh, the NBA is known as arguably one of the strongest unions in the country because of their robust protections for athlete rights and compensation and their model of distribution of revenue. And while the WNBA isn't doing as great on the revenue distribution front, they've been huge when it comes to supporting the athletes' rights to protest and have their First Amendment rights. So college athletes can look at all these different ways that professional sports leagues have done that. We should look at the graduate workers when it comes to some strategies, uh, because we're in this really similar and precarious situation. So for those not aware, um, Graduate labor movement is thriving all over this country right now. We have graduate workers and researchers fighting to be paid uh, a fair wage. Fortunately, we're paid something, but well less than like, the cost of living and surviving in a lot of places. And in a lot of cases, we have to pay to do our job. Um, at the University of Colorado Boulder campus, our big action right now is making it so that we don't have to pay our bosses to do our job. If that sounds crazy, welcome to the world of graduate labor. Um, and the way these things change is in part just sharing this information. So the public sees these great football games and this fancy you know, sports teams and the emails that get sent out. They see these wonderful classes taught. But unless we have a brave athlete or worker, we don't hear about going to bed hungry or anything. We don't hear about the graduate labor case. Oh, our bosses forgot to pay us for a month. Oh, well, the media is going to be an ally when it comes to making this push. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, just a brief note, I'm not really going to talk much on the Northwestern unionization case. Um, so sorry. Um, but yeah, so it's important. The courts did know, of course, these are workers. I think all of us know these are workers. Um, but interestingly, they lost the unionization vote due to some pretty clear, just standard union-busting tactics about how things happen. Um, so if there was going to be a unionization vote today on any college campus, odds are most would lose. It does take a bit of a process to start viewing yourself as workers. Publicizing this, getting support is key. Then we need to start building solidarity. Have your rallies, have your big public events where you make statements. It, yes, builds attention, but it also builds among your fellow workers, athletes, that we're in this together as workers. But of course, one thing will change the entire landscape. Strength. Just imagine if the University of Alabama football team said, you know what? We're not going to go play unless you pay us some of the millions of dollars that come in when we're talking about ticket revenue and advertising. Imagine if the final four didn't happen because those teams came together and said, hey, billions of dollars are being like bet on us right now. Folks are missing work to watch it, huge sponsorships. Let's like take a knee until they give us our rights. Within maybe not a day, but a year, these athletes would have a seat at the table. They easily have the power to do that. I think that's my next slide. As well. Yeah, shut it down. There's no question in my mind that the landscape of big time college sports would change overnight if athletes viewed themselves as workers. But I recognize that this room is not full of college athletes. It's full of people who care about sports. Lots of us are affiliated in some way with member institutions. So in the last 10 seconds, I want you to think about what can you do? Because it's obvious that the system we have now is exploitative and unjust. And if we take part in that system, we are complicit. So think about what can you do, given your position, to change the nature of this exploitation of all these young folks? And how can you make a difference? So with that, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, Jeff Parsons, who's the executive chair of By Design Group. He's also an Olympian and an activist. We were actually in the same games, 1984. <laughs> <laughs> only, only our mother could tell us apart. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my name is Jeff Parsons. I, I normally start every speech with the same opening line by saying I'm going to answer the question I'm asked most frequently in life. I am six foot eight tall. However, that line is completely ruined by having to sit here, sitting down, 
not being able to stand up. <laughs> However, I am an Olympic high jumper, I'm a politician in the UK at regional level, and I'm a businessman. Um, I've been round the block in the world of athlete representation and other issues in sport. I was the observers of the National Anti Doping Panel in the UK for three years. Uh, I've done some non exec directorships largely around governance on governing bodies. And I created the principle in the UK in 1997 when lottery money first arrived in the UK that the athletes should have a funded organisation, government funded. We ended up with the bastard son of what we set out to do, excuse my language, which is the British Athletes Commission. but. We, we got the principle of a fully funded athlete organisation funded by government. Got that done in 1997. Uh, I'm going to tell you a salutary tale today of what happens um, when sport meets the law and neither party is ready for it. Um, it. It's a bit like a forced marriage where you both turn up at the altar, you both know each other really well, but you've never met before. And, and kind of the Jess Varnish case um, was a bit like that, and I'm going to reference that today. Um, Jess Varnish was a British cyclist. Um, she was identified at the age of 12 um, uh, as British talent and she remained inside the UK sports lottery bubble until she was 24, at which point she was removed from funding. The governing body claimed that that was due to performance issues. Um, Jess claimed, I, I, I don't know Jess personally, so I have no vested interest in the personalities in this case. Uh, Jess claimed that she was removed from funding because of comments she made about the selections and the coaches and the climate of bullying within the governing body. Um, what was interesting is this then took place behind a background where UK Sport, the funding body in Great Britain, uh, set off two investigations, one specifically into the claim of bullying. Uh, the coach, uh, who it was asserted, had bullied and um, resigned before having to face a case and the wider investigation into the climate uh, of uh, the, uh, British cycling uh, declared that uh, there was a climate of fear and bullying uh, within the sport. So this all took place with that background. Um, Jess tried to claim that she was an employee and thus by trying to claim that she was an employee of the governing body sought to then, hopefully, um, start to seek redress via different legal routes. Uh, and the main one that she would have claimed was wrongful dismissal. Something which I, as an employer, fully understand with my employees, because every one of my employees has an employment contract. Um, every person around Jess, within the governing body, has an employment contract and a pension. Every single one. Nobody works in British Cycling without a contract of employment and a pension. Um, just the athlete. Um, was she an employee? The judge um, used what's fairly recognised definitions of an employee, um, uh, and they come from, they're, they're fairly standard uh, in terms of what, what constitutes an employee uh, within a, a work situation. Um, there were three criteria which, if you can prove one of those, you, you are in the frame of being an employee. You can start to seek redress as an employee. Did the worker agree to provide her own work and skill in return for remuneration? Did the worker agree expressly or implied to be subject to a sufficient degree of control for the relationship to be one of master and servant? I want you to remember that one. That middle one I particularly want you to remember in a few minutes. Um, were the other provisions of the contract consistent with it being a contract of service? Now, the judge decided to bring forward a whole raft of arguments for points one and three. Um, including things like she's not a worker because um, she does her own tax returns. Now interestingly at the same time in the UK, the tax arm of the UK government, HMRC, was arguing that contractors in the IT industry who only have one employer, uh, who only have one contract, are employees. They're not, they're not external, even though they pay their own tax for national insurance. So uh, contradictory arguments from, from that uh, particular position. But the middle one was really interesting. Uh, about control and master servant. Uh, two of my favourite quotes from the judge's verdict, and anyone who knows sport knows this is where the two people meet who don't know each other. The judge decided there was no obligation on the claimant to accept coaching support from the coach supplied to her by British Cycling. Now, anybody who knows when you live inside a governing body, you, you don't turn down the services of the coach that you're given by the governing body. 
So, you know, I, I had to smile at that particular issue. Um, the second point, I accept that there was some inequality of bargaining power between the parties. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> the multi-million pound governing body, supported by the government funding agency, against a kid with a bike. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. That was, a, that was a law degree and a big long time. The judge came out with that one. That's pretty cool. Um, I love this statement because this is how, in the final verdict, he summed up why the power imbalance had been redressed. I find the opportunity to obtain advice on the agreement, whether from her parents or an agent, so the claimant was clear about its terms, ameliorate the inequality of bargaining power between the claimant and the first respondent. So because she could talk to her mum and dad, that was fine. I mean, that's what the judge ruled, and that took away part two of the three reasons where you try to justify being an employee. Throughout the process, Jess lost the case, and it's still subject to the potential of an appeal, so there is work going on that she might be able to appeal the case. The case was heard in uh, November, December uh, of 2018. Throughout the case, UK Sport, the funding body, took an interesting position and interestingly, I heard the same argument this morning. And I had to smile. I asked a question at the NCAA session about why we buy athletes the world over don't trust the bodies that run them. And one of the standard tactics used by all these governing bodies and agencies was immediately brought out, which was, you know, less people will get funded if we do things for you extra. And that came out from the stage this morning. Those of you that were there will recognize that argument, the divide and conquer argument. So it was used pre the case, and then this statement came out. Um, UK, this was a headline in The Guardian, a newspaper in the UK. UK sport boss Liz Nicholl has denied threatening Jess Varnish with bankruptcy in their legal dispute, um, but warned that there would be significant implications if the former track cyclist wins. And those significant implications were we're going to fund less athletes and it's your fault, Jess. The usual tactic of setting athlete against athlete. Uh, she also made a statement which said that uh, uh, we, we just sent uh, Jess's lawyers uh, a letter out of courtesy saying that there'd be costs. No, no issue there, and I'm sure Jess was, was perfectly fine about that and not worried at all. Um, my suggestion, um, we've heard a lot about collective bargaining and the issues around it. It's a, just a very simple point. We as athletes need to live in a much better legal framework with our relationship with governing bodies, international federations, and the IOC. Otherwise, we will continue to be subject to abuse, not abuse just because we're removed from funding or we're not selected for the team. We see the power imbalance provide an environment for sexual abuse of athletes. It, it's just rampant. In any other situation, where there is monopoly provision of service, I as a high jumper, I cannot go anywhere else but to my athletic governing body to seek my service, to do my job. In any other walk of life, where there is a monopoly provision of service, we would be doing things to prevent that and would be strict. But in the world of sport, not only do we have a monopoly provision of service, that's young people are our recipients. And we put less protection around those young people than we do in the world of work and industry, where I'm pretty big and ugly enough to look after myself, thank you. These are kids, these are children. I don't care that Jess is now 28 years old and was 24 when this all started happening. She has lived inside a lottery bubble, which prevented her from doing other things. She lived inside, she is a kid with a bike who goes pretty fast around the track. And yet we allow that environment of monopoly provision to exist and we put very little around it. And these are children. And we just don't take our responsibility seriously enough. So, we do need to address it. And whether it's by collective bargaining, whether we go on strike, a whole raft of issues, we need a different construct to allow the abuse at every level to stop. Thank you. So I'll start the first question, actually, and that is, um, um, so um, is Han Chao in the room? 
Khan is uh, the, head, the chair of the AAC, the elected chair for the United States Olympic Committee's AAC. And <clears throat> um, they formed a nonprofit. It went through all the work of forming it. And, <clears throat> and the USOC came back to them and said, but we'll give you more money if you agree not to have this separate organization. So if you agree to, um, to uh, you know, having a better funded AAC, which right now gets $175,000 a year, which is, Pretty nice. uh, it's just nothing compared to what their salaries are. And with that money, I mean, there's no money for like a secretary. I mean, what, what Han Xiao is able to do is just mind boggling. Um, so, um, um, so, so do, uh, uh, do you think that that um, that that's going to be a good bargain long term? That they'll get money from that the AAC will get better funded, and they'll get you know secretaries and maybe legal support and you know the, the, or having a separate organization that doesn't get any funding from. If, if we so, put aside the argument about the structure of athlete organizations, elected and represented, if we part that for a moment. Uh, about that, who is it? Right. Athlete organisations have a right to exist. Governments, if, if I talk from a Western perspective, certainly in the UK, governing bodies in the UK receive direct government funding, what's, uh, government money, what's called exchequer funding, and then they receive lottery money for the high performance programmes. In my view, uh, the athlete organisation should be funded to the same level as the highest paid governing body. From government money. That would be the principle I would lay down because we have a responsibility for everybody across all of the landscape. Each governing body only has a responsibility for those within its landscape. So I would suggest that as a principle that players' organisations should receive the same level of funding that the highest paid governing body gets and that would then settle the landscape fairly quickly. There'd be some sharp intakes of breath um, uh, at various different levels if we put that in place. Yeah, because USA Swimming gets, is a, has a $30 million budget. I don't know what some of the other NGBs, what their budget is. Um, but I think many of you know what the salaries are for those who work in the Olympic Committee. Um, I have a lot to say about that. Anyway, <coughs> so... When Ms. Nick, I feel more slightly, and when Ms. Yeah. Nick left after nine years as Chief Executive of UK Sport, she left with a six-figure pension and a, and a royal honours. And when Jess left at 24, she left with nothing. That, that, that's the power, that's the differentiation between athletes and the people around us. Yeah. So Allie Reisman, I've gotten to be friends with her mom. <clears throat> uh, for most of her career, she made a thousand dollars a month from the national governing body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And right after the Olympics, when there was like the tour that was going on, she got four thousand dollars a month. And the bonuses that the executives were getting for having done so well in 2016 were much, much bigger than an Olympic champion who just won a gold medal. They, they, they gave bonuses to themselves rather than to the athletes. Okay, well, why don't we open it up for questions? I think we've got the lay of the land. Eva? Thank you. I'm Eva Rodansky and I come from speed skating and my comments and questions are for Jeff. Um, I have uh, trained with the national team in speed skating for one season and I did actually reject national team invites after that because I was literally used as a guinea pig in an overtraining experiment to collect data and um, subsequently had to pay for my own coach. And so um, I would love to see athletes be able to get together and stand up um, for their own sponsorship rights just so like in this country they can pay for their own coaches. We're always, we were in fights with our federation about um, logo space on our racing suits, etc. Um, but I think over the long term what we've seen is that the athletes are kind of unwilling to stand together and there's been attrition in the ranks because the only athletes who end up being able to continue in their sports are the ones who have their parents' support and their strategy is to completely suck up and sell out to the NGB leadership. I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, the, the, reason, the reason some of these things happen is, is one of the bit, there's, two, there's a one of our prime ministers, Tony Blair, made a statement when he arrived in government, and he said there's three things that matter: education, education, and education. 
There's three things that matter to athletes. Selection, selection, and selection. Unless we put a boundary, which is, which is so strong around the link between performance and selection, if we can't protect that bond, absolutely sacrosanct, then all the rest of the abuse is open to happen because that's the power imbalance to the athlete is I will not select you for funding for the team, for the next camp. And, and the fact that that is not sacrosanct. You know, I like the American system, turn up on the day, first three pass the post, great. That's, that's really easy, we all understand that. And, and it got diluted by people like the IAAF when they couldn't get their world champion to come. So we'll now pick the world champions from the last games to come. But the reality is it's a, it's a pretty good system because the bond between performance and reward is absolute. You cross the line on the day you're told, you come first, second, I don't care that you've got a cold when you wake up. You've got to protect that boundary at all cost for the athlete. Because that's really what matters. I'm a performer, I want to jump high. So that's the bond that matters. The rest of it then can fall into place more easily. Here's a, here's a challenge and an idea that turns the world upside down. Let's stop giving governing bodies money. The elite bit, not, not the grassroots bit and the regulatory bit and those bits. The elite part of sport in the UK. Here's, here's a challenge. Let's give the winner of the trials, in whatever you do, let's give them a quarter million pounds. And the second place person, 200,000, and the third person, 150,000. Now what you do with that is up to you. If you go and pay a good coach, and pay a physio, a massage, make sure your tax and your financial affairs are in order, good on you. Because next year if you come back and come first, I'll give you another 250,000 pounds. You come fourth, I'll give you squat diddly. Come back next year, you weren't good enough, sorry. If you go and buy a Ferrari, instead of a coach and a massage, if you come back and win next year, I'll give you the money, I don't care because I care about performance. The rest of the infrastructure and grassroots, government body can do that job. But at the performance in the end that I live in, or lived in, I'm about performance. And I'll give you the money because you won. And you go do what you like. I hope you're a very strong, very well-funded athletic organisation that you trust, educates you to make good decisions, educates you to go get a coach, educates you to go worry about your mental health, educates you to go and do the right thing. But if you go buy a Ferrari, and you come back with me next year, well done. Anybody else? I'll just add that um, that right now there's a big battle of, um, of national governing bodies frequently want subjective criteria. They want to be able to pick who makes the Olympic team. And so it's a power issue. And if it's purely objective, then they don't have the same power, right? So, so what makes what makes sexual abuse a big issue in swimming, where it's first or second Olympic trials? We didn't get top three. Uh, first or second Olympic trials, and you go versus um, you know gymnastics, which after the Olympic trials, nobody knows. Only, you only know who one person is on the team. This past uh, Olympic trials for 2016, there was an athlete who got tenth at Olympic trials and made the team. And the rumor is that her, she was one of the Nassar victims, one of the early ones that came forward, and she instead of got less money in exchange for a place on the team. And the national governing body was able to do that. We're gonna give you a place on the team. And it's a zero sum game. That means somebody else didn't get a place on the team. But if they have, they kind of jigger their, uh, their selection criteria so that it's really subjective. It really makes, puts athletes at real risk. We, we don't pay enough attention in this world to that bond between performance and reward. Right. Because that's all that really matters to an athlete. Before 2012, we, we had lots of complaints and issues around selection. And we used to get all the selection policies come into the body that we use in the UK from sports resolutions. And I'll tell you how you know whether a selection policy is good or not. <coughs> and you, you do that and you feel the thickness. If, if, if it's got four pages, it's probably a good selection policy. If it's got 16 pages to select the first three to go to the Olympic Games, you probably know it's a really rough policy and it's all about manipulation because they want the percentage of the first person in the second race with three legs against the horse to be selected against the version of... Yeah, it's crazy. Feel the thickness of selection policy and you'll know how good it is. 
a hundred pages for speed skating for yeah, yeah. Six, so to get to get six people in twelve yeah, people yeah. and it feels like that's manipulation. That's what they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah you just yeah. have to feel the thickness, and you know that there is a good policy. Yeah, right now we're taking chance of being a good policy. Excuse me for jumping. There, uh, uh, in table tennis right now, there's uh, it's called a, a section nine complaint because uh, the athletes want objective criteria. Table tennis is like somebody wins, somebody loses, right? It's just like swimming. It's not like say rowing or soccer or anything like that. Um, and um, you know, the coach really wants to have wants to be essentially be able to pick the team. And the athletes don't want that, so they're battling it out right now. But that is one of the ways that they, the more objective that those criteria can be, even in subjective sports, there is objectivity. Even in subject, they do ultimately have a winner and a loser. So, um, um, yeah. All right, next question. David. Yeah, I, Dave Ridpath from Ohio University. I, I guess the question would be for everyone, but I'll focus on, on John and Alex. I, I've also been, been fascinated with the workers' rights aspect of this, and uh, certainly there has been some effort with the Northwestern case, uh, Ramogi Huma and the National Collegiate Players Association. Um, from an organization perspective and what we can do, the athletes have power, and I'm wondering even in Europe, if athletes did exercise union-type tactics to force change, force greater representation. One, for John and Alex, how do we do that in America? What's the best way to do that? And maybe for you, Jeff, is would that be an effective strategy in Europe? So it has to be led by the athletes. I think any kind of movement for power has to be led by those seeking their rights. But that doesn't mean that the rest of us should be on the sidelines. Um, so for those of us on college campuses in instructor style roles, in public facing roles, should be incredibly clear that we stand with college athletes as exploited workers, we stand with them in their struggles, whatever direction they want to take them, that we will be there to support them if it's picket mining stuff, if it's um, showing up at events for publicity, if it's education and connecting to other resources. So one of the tough things um, for college athletes, as I mentioned, is they're on campus for four or five years. They're also like 18 to 23. Um, so there's definitely a lack of just organizing experience generally. So those of us who have that experience should be willing to help, just you know, give that support. One of the great things in the labor movement in this country is how supportive everybody is. Um, so in the graduate labor movement, for example, um, so on campus, just see you border, I helped start our graduate labor union in 2016. None of us have any experience. We've won, um, since we started, 27.1% increase in our pay. We're still paid well below cost of living, made of a lot of um, real moves. Because we've had support from other union folks in industry and other graduate stuff across the country, because people care. So any of us with this knowledge should be there to talk to these athletes, to bounce ideas around. But they have to lead the charge, and we have to kind of do what they think is best. Have you ever had a strike? For the, for the graduate students? Working on that. Um, so before you strike, you need to make sure that you have the support that's going to work well. The absolute worst thing you can do for a labor movement is call a strike and have it fail, have not enough show up. Yeah. So like, yes, if, um, so the CU buffs, so here's how much we care about like academics and stuff on our campus. Yesterday morning got an email <laughs> about how we're going to close a bunch of athletic buildings at 3 o'clock on Friday for football because, you know, that's what matters. Um, so if those athletes decided just not to play this weekend, that would, that would make a difference like that. But I don't think they would do it from the gun. If they haven't, I would love it if they had these conversations behind closed doors, but if they haven't built up the solidarity and this view that they are workers, it's really hard. So those of us who are going to be institutions for a long time um, have to be willing to help build this infrastructure and build this worker consciousness. Um, so we're doing a work stoppage uh, at noon o'clock on Sunday. We're doing a big week of action to not have to pay our bosses next week. Um, and then using that to build up towards if we needed a, a strike. And I think college athletes, same kind of thing. Um, I mean, a couple of the, the things that, especially with the unionization that I think are interesting is, um, and Alex had mentioned this before, 
the, the just voting to unionize, getting the players to vote yes as opposed to no. Um, and when Northwestern was trying to do that, you heard all of the comments coming out of Pat Fitzgerald, the head coach of Northwestern, saying how this was such a bad idea. That, you know, and if you're an 18, 19 year old football player, and your head coach is standing in front of you and saying, you know, this is really bad. We're not going, this isn't going to happen. I mean, yes, um, it does raise some um, um, NLRA questions, whether they violated the National Labor Relations Act or not. Um, but it's still a difficult situation. And so I think unionizing, unionizing is going to be hard just to get the, past that coach and getting the, um, the board to certify that and make sure that the coaches are, I guess, controlled, if that's the right word. Um, the other kind of comment I wanted to make is that the athletes have shown power. Right? The good example is the Missouri case a few years back, where all of a sudden the football players at Missouri were upset at the, uh, the, the comments that were being made. The football coach supported his players. They said they were going to boycott the game. Um, all of a sudden, the, the, ch the president or the chancellor of the university is fired, um, and the game goes on. And so they were able to show their power, show their strength in numbers. Um, and clearly, the what the school found more important than that president was playing that game on Saturday. Um, and so, uh, so I agree with Alex that you know if they could show that power, if they could show, but I think trying to think back to being a 20 year old kid playing in the final four, it's Monday night, you've got you know, 50 million people watching you and you're going to Coach K saying, yeah, I'm not gonna play today. Yeah, yeah. it's just not gonna happen. Um, I, I don't know, they'd probably take 15 kids from the, the pep squad and throw them in uniforms just so that there'd be a game out there, right? Um, but yeah, it'd be an interesting. I'd watch it. <laughs> I, I think the question needs to be reversed. I think you need to say, how frightened must all these athletes be that we've never got together? There you go. How frightened are these kids that we've never been able to get together? That's how scared the workforce, if I use that term, are. And that's because every time they do get together, retribution is swift. High jumpers are quite a bullshy bunch of people. I told this story to somebody over lunchtime, and in the World Championships, I think it was 1987 in Rome. The, the rules of the sport allowed us at a point, there were two pools qualifying, and there were 16 of us that just cleared the last height. And in theory, there's meant to be 12 taken through to the final. But the way the rules were written, everyone who cleared a height, if that's where it ended, went forward. So we spoke to each other on the fan, and we decided we weren't going to jump anymore, because it meant all 16 of us went through. We were all tired late at night, finals tomorrow. 16 of us go through, great. So the first three or four of us ran round and tipped the bar up with our hand out. Within five minutes, we had the entire array of the officials of the world around us. We were carted off the track after the fourth person did it. And within 12 months, the rules of my sport were changed, so you could no longer do that. You had to keep jumping until only 12 were left. They changed the rules on us because we exerted our right, exerted our power, and they smashed it. Can I that again? Disastrous. And, and that, was the, we, that was what we did to collect because we all knew each other. We spent three hours on a competition once a week, once a fortnight together. So we, we had enough confidence in each other. Nobody jumped and we're all through. So let's take the issue into our own hands and we'll fight by the fire tomorrow. And the retribution was fast, and swift, and brutal. And, and that's just one tiny little corner of the sporting universe. And just one tiny thing. So that does illustrate, if for any of those who are in the morning session, about this idea that, oh, we should trust all these officials and administrators <laughs> to do right by the athlete. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so um, you, you guys have talked about uh, striking and being able to unionize. The Olympics are only once every four years. What's the likelihood that an Olympic athlete is going to be able to strike? It, it's incredibly hard because it's your one shot. If you're a worker and you go to go on strike, you, you've got a chance you're going to go back to your job tomorrow morning or the day after or when the strike ends. But for an athlete to go on strike on the final of the men's 100 metres that you might have spent 8 or 12 years working towards is pretty brutal. And, and it's, it's the ultimate line that 
that we will always struggle to cross because we're at, I'm at, I'm at my age, I want to jump over a bit of stick, God knows why. I want to jump over a bit of stick for a living for 20 years. <laughs> it, 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 why, I didn't say it, no idea. But that drives you. I want to be out on the stage for me. And, and, and that's always going to deter the athlete from sticking their head above the parapet. And it's used by all these people who sat on the stage today when I asked the question, who sit and tell we're doing so much to benefit the athletes. We're, we're just doing so much. We're, we're, we're on their side. We're the, uh, just like, you know, it's just so false and fake. I don't actually know why they continue to peddle the line. I really don't. You, you know, you, so weak. You, you sound like you work for the USOPC. <laughs> that's or the their, NCAA. Is. Like, yeah, that's their line. It's like, you know, yeah. So it's always going to be a struggle for us because it, it's our one chance. I'm 19 years old, and it's my one, my parents have sacrificed for the last six years to get me to the stage. And it's always going to be difficult to cross that line and strike. We've got to find a way of leveraging power and, and helping young people still be able to do their job. Yeah, I was going to say, even with professional athletes here in the United States, it's still a really difficult decision to go out on strike. If I'm an NFL player, my average career length is three years. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give up one of those for somebody down the road to, to benefit. So it's hard. I mean, you have to self-sacrifice. Yeah, there's there's no doubt this is going to be hard, even though I think obviously athletes should do it. Like, I don't want to downplay those risks. What that tells all of us in the audience is how important our role is Absolutely. out there to be as clear as we can be that we will stand with the athletes for anything they need put our necks out there and make this more likely and more plausible. Because really, to make change, it's not a strike you need, it's a threat of a strike. And if we can get enough support, if we can get enough of us at a picket line and walking in, that could still help have some effects. We should take as much of the risk as possible off of the rules. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. So um, I hear what you're saying, and, and this makes a lot of sense. Of, just, oh. Okay. Um, I appreciate everything you've shared. I was just thinking about how, you know, you're talking about, I'm, I'm speaking of college athletics and this idea of like, these young people, if you look at the, the schedule of a football player, when on earth would they learn to find time to organize with other players and actually go on strike? I mean, you're in this bubble where the coach is dominating. And they're exhausted. And they're exhausted, yeah. And, and that goes for a lot of different sports, right? So like, where do they even, I'm always stunned when I interview college athletes how separated they are from the rest of campus, right? They go in their little study area, they're friends with only their own team, that sort of thing, other athletes. So like, how do we even reach them in order to help them learn about some of these ideas? Yeah, no, that, that's an incredibly real problem. Like, where is the time, you know, how is that ability? So I think all of us who are instructors, um, whatever we teach, if there's you know, anything remotely related to just general rights and general ethics, you can get a lot of this stuff. Um, so, for example, I'm currently teaching a class on philosophy of law. Um, so a big thing we talked about is consent, which obviously matters a ton on the college campus. But when you start talking about your consent, you start realizing, wait, this you can choose to play college sports or not. You recognize how little consent there really is for those who actually want to go on. Um, so it, obviously, depending on what you teach, it's not going to be relevant. Um, but if you teach on anything connected to ethics and values or economics and business, there's something there. But no, it's it's tough. Well, in the Northwestern case, they used. I mean, there was outside organizers that came and helped. Um, and you had a group of players who wanted to unionize. Who, you know, the thought was there, and they were trying. Um, but interestingly. Even though they wanted the, the regional board, when it went to the, the full board in DC, the board refused jurisdiction. They basically said, we're going to give this back to the NCAA. Oh, I don't, that's not quite what they said. They're basically refusing jurisdiction. They said, well, let's see what the NCAA is going to do about this. They seem to be, there seems to be something happening. And if this problem still persists, then we'll come back and revisit it. Um, kind of an interesting excuse not to um, give a decision. Uh, another interesting thing about the, the players, though, is one of the, the chair of the National Labor Relations Board, when he was uh, leaving his post with the new president, 
um, his term was just up, it wasn't anything else. Um, he actually wrote an opinion letter to the rest of the board saying that in future cases, college athletes should be considered um, um, employees of the university. So there is, I mean, it doesn't really carry much weight, but it is there. And so there is that kind of movement. Um, and I mean, this, but I guess the one of the things to be careful about with the Northwestern case, that only affected 17 schools in the country. Um, private schools like Syracuse, Northwestern, Notre Dame. Um, schools like Colorado are, are different because they have to abide by Colorado State of law. So the labor laws are going to be different there too. <coughs> Yeah, you know, people ask me all the time, my, my work is I do a lot with sexual abuse and uh, trying to get the Olympic movement to make some changes. And people say, they, they just can't believe that there would be pushback, right? Like, well, how could you not be in favor of protecting kids from sexual abuse? And the answer is, for the same reason why the NCAA doesn't want to unionize, why they don't want to have athletes be able to have their own group is because once an athlete is able to say no, once you break up that authoritarian system, once an athlete, um, in, in order to give an athlete the right to say no, you also have, you, you know, then, then you have to pay them appropriately and you have to uh, you know, give them all sorts of rights. You can't just, you know, there's one segment. So it, uh, protecting athletes from sexual abuse does upset the apple cart. Um, a lot of times my funders at Champion Women want to know, like, why are you spending all this time on United States Olympic Committees, uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committees governance? Like, aren't you have to do with women's rights? And like, that's how you get to protect athletes from sexual abuse is through this governance angle. So, thank you all very much for your expertise. Um, this is really fun.